welcome back to the show everybody and on this show we wanted to discuss a little bit further the situation going on at my hometown football club reading football club now of course there was protest the other day on the pitch against port vale um to get Dai Yong out of the club. The supporters group, Star, and also a campaigning group, Sell Before We Die, have been instrumental in pushing the narrative which has made national headlines. And during this show, we will be speaking to one of the board members of Star, and of course, the spokesperson of Sell Before We Die. So it is a pleasure to welcome onto the show Nick Holton. Thank you for joining us, Nick. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, mate. Yeah. Um, I mean, aside from the football, but personally I'm okay. Uh just it could be better times in the football, and it's uh a bit demoralizing at the moment, unfortunately, at Reading. Well, as everybody will know, I was born and bred in Reading, um, grew up in the town. Used to go to Elm Park, went to the Medeski Stadium, witnessed the 106 season. Um, and then before I moved down to Bournemouth and the South Coast. Um, so that's a little bit of touching on my story. But why I want to bring that up is that Reading were the staple of how to run a football club, weren't they, Nick? And the club was never in debt under John Medeski. Yeah, um, back when John Medeski ran the club, he he, re- he rebuilt the club, bought the well, paid a pound for the land for Medeski Stadium, built the stadium, took us forward, uh, funded uh, in a sustainable way our, our push up the leagues in that 106 point season, which was just incredible. It's probably the most uh, enjoyable season I've I've ever had as a fan. I don't think it would ever be topped, even even the Premier League season after that. I think that season, just because we were just battering teams every week, was incredible. Um, and if you look at, I, I look at uh, Brentford and Brighton in particular at the moment, and they're sort of like we used to be, but with a modern twist to it in terms of how they recruit players and uh, how they've adapted to now the big finances in football since since then. Uh, but at that point, Brentford's and Brighton's and Bournemouth's at the time. I mean, we were just talking about Bournemouth off off air and uh, where they were 15 years ago. And uh, they had a huge point deduction at bottom of League Two, I remember, and yeah. really close to going out of business themselves. So they, they'd been there and uh, they would look up at Reading at that time. And it's the opposite now. Those teams have transformed and Luton too. They've all transformed and got to as they call it, the promised land and uh, run so well and so efficiently. And they've come over these hurdles and uh, mountains that they've had to go go over. And uh, Reading are now the opposite. They're, they're the club that where were where, where Luton, Bournemouth, Brighton, Brentford uh, are now. And now they are where they were before. So, yeah, I think those fans will understand. And uh, we understand where they are now, but you guys will understand where we are at the moment. I know that this man isn't particularly popular with Reading fans um, after he did leave to West Ham back in 2003. But Alan Pardew did make a point the other day um, on TalkSport that Reading have Premier League facilities. They're a Premier League club in all but name and all but financial management. And let's be honest, the facilities are brilliant. The stadium's brilliant. You know, it has got everything going for it. Yeah, we've got a 24,000-seat stadium that can increase to 38,000. And uh, I mean, that's unlikely. But if we were in the Premier League and stabilised there, that that could happen. And I think if we had survived that second season under Steve Koppel, they were probably going to do that. It's just lifting the stadium, so it shouldn't, shouldn't be too much of an effort. Um, and the training ground, I mean, the old training ground was okay, uh, Hogwood, and we've now got Bearwood, and and uh, it's probably the only good thing Mr. Dye's done, he's, he's spent 200 million on a training ground, in fairness to him there, um, and that training ground is as good, if not better, than a lot of Premier League clubs, um, like Charlie Savage, when he signed in the summer, 
was saying it's as good as Carrington at Manchester United. That's how good this training ground is. I've been there. I've seen it. It's yeah. special. It's a special training ground. And uh, it shouldn't be in League One, that training ground. But that, that's no divine right to be higher up the league, obviously. But we've got the foundations and the facilities for a good owner to come in and he doesn't need to put so much money in certain areas because it's already there. That infrastructure's there. All he has to do is run us sustainably on the pitch and off the pitch as well. But there's no new stadium required unless he wants to expand it. But I can't see it really. I don't think we'll need a bigger than 24,000, maybe not, not for a long time. And the training ground is so brilliant. It just doesn't, it's state of the art. So we are a desirable club. And in a catchment area, I must add, that is... 40 miles from London, near up far from Heathrow, um, a Category 1 academy, a very great reputation as an academy. I mean, Man City have said, uh, don't change anything. To Brian Carey, the head of recruitment, don't change anything with your academy. We take a player, at least one player, every season. And they've taken uh, a, a young 16-year-old striker from us for about a million plus add-ons uh, this season, Jamie Bino Gittens, who's now at Dortmund, was another one they took from us a yeah. few years ago. And uh, you know, we've we've got the infrastructure and the foundations to go far. I mean, at least be a solid championship side, or at least, uh, I mean, at the very least, uh, a well-run League One club, which we're not at the minute. We're a poorly run League, League One club with amazing facilities, which is just mind-boggling, really. And of course, um, we're making it all sound very, very rosy at Reading, but we'll come to the elephant in the room in a moment. Um, We all know who that is. But um, the academy as well, a Category 1 academy that was built up by Aim Dolan, a man who sadly is no longer with us, you know, and the legacy that he's left, you know, it is... An outstanding the, the production line's fantastic. Yeah, uh Eamon Dolan um really, really built this academy. I mean, he was put in charge. I mean, to be honest, it's so sad he passed away so young. I really think he was likely to be uh a Reading first team manager at some point. He, he was caretaker once or twice, did okay. And uh he was somebody that may have got that shot, and I would have loved to see him do that. So it's such a such a shame, really. But a lot of uh, young players who've come through, even the ones now will know of him and know him a little bit from when they were really young. But we've got so many young stars that have come through because of him and know their careers to him in some ways. And even a lot of the Irish lads we used to bring over, Kevin Doyle and Shane Long. Don't know about it. it was Eamon Dolan and his brother, um, Pat. I think it's his brother, uh, Pat Dolan. And uh, Steve Coppel went to watch those, those two because of Eamon Dolan. Um, and... You know, we've got a stand named after him now. And uh, yeah, this academy, we've got Category 1 Academy. We got demoted for a year because uh, we failed for Category 1 sort of requirements uh, during the COVID. We had a few issues with COVID with it and it's gone back up to Category 1. But that academy is going to cost us, to stay as Category 1 will cost us, um, I think it's something like 12 million, 12 million a year. So I, it's a big part. I mean, we, we can't afford it really. I think after this season, we'll probably have to drop down there, but and then we'll lose players and won't be able to attract as many players um, of, of certain talent, uh, which is a, which is a shame. But it's a sacrifice we might have to make. But look at the young players we're, we're bringing through now. I mean, Nelson Abbey, England under twenty international, is about to sign for a Premier League side. Um, I've heard a couple of couple of names, whether it's Luton or Forest, it's going to be one of them. Um, and he's going to be a star. Tom Holmes, who's signing for Luton and coming back on loan, academy. Uh, it was just tons and tons of brilliant, brilliant young players that we've bought for ourselves. And uh, it, I mean, it, it works well because you don't have to buy as many players because you've got a great academy. And at the same time, you can sell them on for a lot of money. And I don't think we've done that very well in the last few years because of uh, a problem with our owner, unfortunately. Well, let's come on to this man. Um, if we call him, can call him that. Um, because what he's done is, and like I said earlier on in the show, you te- Reading were one of the best ran football clubs in the whole of English football. And he has basically destroyed it in the matter of five years. Um, let's go back to the start of his reign because 
there was a point, of course, it was the playoff final against Huddersfield Town um, that was lost on penalties. There was that point that, you know, if we if Reading had got into the Premier League, you know, would it be a whole different story? And what I also want to bring up with you, Nick, if you don't mind, is why, you know, how did the EFL even give him that responsibility, you know, considering he failed the Premier League test at Hull? Yeah, he, he came in in 2017. It was it was weird because it was half time in the playoff semi second leg against Fulham, and it was announced he's the owner. So his and we won that game one nil. Went for an uh, aggregate, I think two one. And uh, the next game is the playoff final against Huddersfield. It was a rubbish game. Huddersfield maybe edged it, but it was drab. And we lost on penalties, and we actually took advantage of the penalty shootout initially. So if Liam Moore had scored, and then Jordan beat a. Uh, would have had to score as well, but we were we would have gone up, and uh, yeah, so we didn't go up. But if we did, I think you were saying, how would we have got on? And uh, I think it would have been the same story in some respects. We would have just had a bit of a pot of money to fall back on for a period of time. And this process where we are now would have been delayed by two or three years, unless he got a bit lucky and we did establish ourselves. But he would have just spent a lot of money without other than Premier League TV money, without bringing much money in, and he would have spent big money and big wages on on average footballers. And that's what he started to do from the next summer, that summer after the Huddersfield defeat. And uh, I think we spent something like seven and a half million on Sonny Aluko. He was he was a very good player at Fulham at the time, but seven and a half million is 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 crazy for a average to half decent championship winger at the time. And he really flopped, sadly. And uh, he spent big wages on, on players with new contracts. Um, free, even the free transfers we got in were getting mega contracts. I mean, a lot of players were on 20 to 40k a week. And we were spending over 200, I think at one point it was like 235% or something like that above turnover, which is just on wages. And this is just, that's just mental. And this is partly why we're in the situation. And, and look, I mean, someone raised it. I think it was Simon Jordan raised it earlier. Like we were probably lapping up when we were spending the money on Puskas for eight million and a Luco for seven and a half million. And to some extent, you do. But I think we've all been there. And Bournemouth have done it too. You know, we've yeah. both spent a bit of money on players, and it is exciting. You can't deny that we're fickle. We're football fans, but it starts to when you don't sell players. And which is what Mr. Dyes refused to do. If you don't start selling players and refusing 10 million offers for, for players like Liam Moore, and that's where it's going to come back to buy. And we've lost these players for free while being stuck on huge wages and then not being able to offload them. And it's it's come back to hurt us. But yeah, I think it'd be the same even if we went up to the Premier League, if I'm honest. When you look back on it now in his tenure, he would have just he would have spent money and it may have worked. It may have worked, but eventually, and especially if it didn't work, it was going to catch up on us. And I just think we would have been two or three years away from it happening anyway. So it would have just happened in 2026, 27, rather than 23, 24 kind of thing. So, yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's not been great. It's how not to run a football club, I think. Yep, completely agree. And the thing is, is if he had taken over at Hull, I think this same scenario would be happening to them because, yep, Hull were in the Premier League at the time, but he would have spent a shed load of money trying to get that club further and further and further up the league. Um, he's see, there's a couple of names, you know, that spring to mind, Nick. That you know, say Kia Jubarakin, you know, he is one person who has been advising. Dijon and Dijon Pang for so long, quite badly. Um, how many villains do you think there is to the piece? Oh wow! Um, so yeah, Kia's Kia's a big one. He's he's used Kia as uh, he's his trusted advisor, really, and he's brought in a lot of players. And there's some good players, I have to say. Like, hasn't it? It wasn't very strategic in terms of the way we were bringing players in and that probably cost us, but there was talent. But these players are on big wages, uh, all linked to one man. And it's just been a bit of a calamity in terms of recruitment each season. And that's part of 
we've just been buying Kia players really as well, which isn't really a good thing. And he's been poorly advised. But another one was uh, Ron Gourlay and um, West Brom will very, very well know. And now, and I remember when he went in at West Brom, we warned them and it took him a while to catch on. But eventually they realised actually he's not great. He upset a lot of staff who'd been at Reading for a long time. Uh, a lot of people left the club. And that's not even players, that's just staff. Uh, you upset a lot of people. Brian Teverden, who had been brilliant on a shoestring budget, was sort of pushed out and went to the other owned Belgium club from Dai, uh, Rosalair at the time, for a little bit. And uh, Ron Gourlay started giving out these massive contracts. So he's another villain, and, and West Brom now know that too. And Key has been involved in Everton, and look at them right now. And it's, it's yeah. picked up a little bit, but they've had the points deduction. And Arsenal, and uh, they, they had a few... A few uh, bad years, I'd say, probably for their standard anyway. And, uh, you know, I don't want to compare to Arsenal, but, you know, they, they dropped off for where they should be a little bit. And I think Kier's involvement sort of adds up as, I don't think it's a coincidence, really. Uh, but yeah, him and Ron Gourlay are, are the villains. And then Mr. Dye himself, he's just, I think initially came in with good intentions, but didn't know what to, how to do it. Just put the wrong people in charge, put the money there, and it's just not worked. And it's cost us now and now he's gone AWOL. He's just le leaving us to die at the moment. And that's not even a pun either, by the way. It's just, he really is leaving us to die. We're on our knees. He's he's disappeared. Mr. Pang disappeared for a while. He's come, he's appeared back and uh, he's the CEO, for those that don't know, Dion Pang. And we actually met him just before Christmas and he told us a load of, a load of stuff yeah. that doesn't appear to be actually true weeks later. So, how worrying is that? Um, these guys just don't care. And Mr. Dye, like, whatever we do now, he just doesn't care. And he's the main villain, but he's put the wrong people in place that have just made things worse in the long run, such as Kieran and Ron Gourlay, who, who are just terrible, terrible people. I mean, when you look at Ron Gourlay, he was at Chelsea, and I think he did quite well there. It's a different size club. But you think, oh, Ron Gourlay, he was at Chelsea, he'll know what, what he's doing. And he's, he doesn't know what to do in the championship. He, he just thought he had Roman Abramovich's money and the Premier League money still, I think. And yeah, I mean, key. I mean, he had dodgy deals at West Ham with Tevez and Mascarano back in the day, if oh, you remember. Right, so, yeah. you know, there's always always signs there. But every time we've said get Kia out of our club, they say, oh, he's not involved because he's not officially involved with us. He's this un unofficial advisor to the owner and he trusts him. He's his friend. And, uh, I believe it's there's a lot of like superstition, like China and things like that, and luck. And uh, I mean, there's rumours he liked players because of their because of their squad numbers and stuff or something a, a while back. It's just very strange and uh, reminds me of Vincent Tan at Cardiff a little bit with the old red red shirts and all that. You know, um, he was Malaysian though, but you know, same sort of same sort of superstition thing there. But yeah, loads of villains, and it's crippled the club, unfortunately, and we're in tons of debt. But all the debt is owed to Mr. Dai. And Mr. Pang told us that Mr. Dai is willing to sell the whole club and will write off all the debt. So we won't have debt. But I've then heard that he's not selling it as a whole package, the stadium and the training ground, which are separate companies but owned by Mr. Dai. That's you just don't know what to believe. He could hang on to us forever while selling the team. He's got he's got his hand in a few different pies. Let's look at the doomsday scenario. And you know what I'm going to bring up here. Um, <laughs> Dai Jong has been responsible, solely responsible for the death of two clubs. So Beijing Ren, of course, in China, and KSV Rosalier in Belgium. How much do you know of those stories, Nick? And how much echoes what is going on with Reading? It's it's worrying for a supporter as soon as you find out one, two clubs that he owns are just gone. Like like the click of your fingers, it wasn't much to it. They just went. It, you always knew at the time that he could do the same with us. And I think a number of fans did raise concerns then. And mm -hmm. I, the one thing I have to say is I think we are, I know VFL are under fire and I'm very critical of VFL, but I do think that we are better protected in this country than Belgium and China, which is the one thing we have got on our side. But 
it's ominous and I think we're heading that way as Rosalaire and Beijing Ren Rene now. Uh the difference with Beijing Rene, I think, is to do with the Chinese Super League, and there's a lot of government money in the Chinese Super League at the time. Yeah. And they pulled support of that or something like that from from what I've read before. And a lot of teams had to change names. And a lot of I think most of the Chinese Super League did go bust. I think there's only a handful of teams that survived and they actually just changed their names rather than actually go bust. So I think pretty much most of, majority of those clubs did all go the same way. Um, and Rousselaire, it it's just bizarre what happened to them. Belgium, they were second division side, like mid-table second division side. I mean, they've got smaller leagues, but they've just gone and no one seemed to care, if you know what I mean. They're not a massive side in Belgium. And I guess, you know, they're not going to get the same appeal as Club Bruges and teams like that. But for them just to disappear and no one sort of asked the questions on that there, it's worrying. But yeah, there's comparisons and I think we are heading that way. I think the one thing we're fortunate enough to have is I do think we are better protected in this country. You can't just cease to exist. You have to go through administration processes. You are part of Sell Before We Die. And you're the spokesperson for the group, but you're also the Supporters Trust at Reading board member. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to also bring up with you was the councils, so the local councils, because Reading Borough Council, of course, have protected the Medeski Stadium or the Select Car Leasing Stadium, as it's called now. Mm -hmm. And I understand the Woken and Borough Council have been asked to do the same with Bearwood. How close is that with Bearwood? And does that diminish the value of the club to Dai Jong? So this was asked the other day about Bearwood, and I believe we can't get... So it's an asset of community value, an ACV, and we got that in the stadium, and it was in there before it expired, and we got that again. It was took a while. There's a lot of paperwork involved. A lot of the guys behind the scenes did, did massive work on that with, with the council, um, you know, Caroline Parker and, and Sarah Turner were, were huge in all of this, and uh, it, it went through. So, the stadium's protected, it's uh, protected under an asset of community value. Yeah. Um, basically, it, it can't just be taken away from us, it's going to be a football stadium, and, and we're okay, but we'll just have to reapply for, to extend it at some point. Uh, I can't remember how long it lasts now, off the top of my head, a few years. Um, so we've got, got a while yet to think about that, uh, but I don't believe there would can have that and i'm not sure the specific reasons on that it could be that it's because it's a private training grounds it's gated it might be that okay what's the community value to that i guess but I, that's probably what it is but i'm not 100 percent on that so that won't happen unfortunately but what i do know is with bearwood is it's protected from any development it has to, if it's sold it has to be sporting use it used to be stables and there's one of the buildings are still actually stables and they've just turned it into they turned it into a building but it's it's still in the, the outside state it looks like stables uh, and it's for whether the women the women uh sort of staff are based in okay. there um so they made good use of that but so it has to be stables or any other sort of sporting use so that's the one thing we do have and know is in place and that's a planning thing it's not anything to do with anything we've done it's uh it's literally just planning rules uh basically um it's right on bearwood lake across from the golf course um so they bought some land i think they bought the land off the golf course off memory when they actually went to build it, it just took a while to actually build it. And the tie it was the tie um owners before who bought the land and then die actually eventually put money in to build the build the training complex itself but it's not so the training ground we can't protect as such like that but it is protected in terms of sports purposes at least excellent good stuff so let's next look at of course how where it all went wrong for Dai Yong so to give some figures 200 million spent 234 percent of turnover um some ridiculous i think it was 13 million if i'm correct in thinking is what the championship says that you know clubs should be um you know all the losses reddings was far far exceeding that and then towards the back end of last season um 
points deductions started happening. And the points deduction eventually got the club relegated. Without that, the club would have survived. So Dai Zhong has relegated his own football club, in my eyes. But then we found out about the HMRC tax bill. And that seems where it's all unraveled. And that's where Sell Before We Die come in, wasn't it? Yeah, so crazy money spent. He's put the money in initially, but spent it poorly, as, as I said earlier. I mean, 200 million, I think, was just for training ground. So he's he's probably yeah. putting more close to 250, I guess, 300 maybe. But he's, he's put in a lot of money, uh, but poorly. Um, points deductions, we've had, including this season, we've had points deductions now for three seasons, which I think, in a row, which I think is a record. Uh, no other team has had them consistent in consistent seasons like we have. Uh, we've had 16 in total points taken from us over the last three seasons. Uh, I think we had six two seasons ago, six last season, and uh, four this season. And uh, hopefully we won't get any more next season or more this season because it's uh, we're sick of it, to be honest. But you know what? Points deduction over... I'll take that over, over like not existing, right? So this is where I'm starting to feel at the moment. Um, but yeah, so... We, so I've lost my track a little bit, Craig. What was no, the... that's all right. So, of course, the processing started after that HMRC. Yeah, bill. yeah, so before we die. Sorry, so yeah. yeah, so so before we die. Um, so it got to June time, I think it was, and uh, something came out, and I think it was late player wages or something like that at the time. Yeah. There was just so much going on, it was like, okay, we need to do something, and we spoke as a few groups. so uh sports trust at reading tyler stand podcast El Pop royals podcast proud royals and uh club 1871 yeah and there was a little bit like okay we're not sure yet okay okay we're not too sure and then days later it was the tax it was one of i can't remember which way round it was but it was, those were the two things that came up within the yeah. space of a few days and when the second one happened i think it was the tax not being paid um it was just like okay we need to start this group now and it just happened so fast like we just created a group um put things in place got together slowly added more to the group uh just sort of key strengths uh so more, a couple more have joined the group as we've gone on and uh we just took action into our own hands about the time it's the off season so it was a really difficult time to start because there's not much you can do we did a lot behind the scenes and we had a lot of prep but we couldn't Everyone was saying, oh, we need to see more. You need to, you know, storm the training ground and whatever else. And it was like, can't I mean, to be fair, Reading heard that because everything was going on Twitter. They see everything and they got wind of it and they got security in anyway. So we weren't even able to do that if we wanted to. Uh, going to the ground, no one's there. There's no games. There's pre-season games. No, no one cares if you storm a pitch against Eastleigh in a pre-season friendly, do they? So it was really tough for about a month before we managed to sort of just get a few more well the league fixtures started and we started doing like the sit-in protests and things like that and eventually that escalated to tennis balls and and the march later on into the season and the march was massive against Portsmouth we got about I think we got over 2,000 fans involved in that maybe 3,000 and that went down so well and then the tennis balls before that and the first game it happened is like 100 balls maybe and then the next time there's 500 600 balls and it it's happened a lot since and even on saturday with the protest to abandon the match balls went on in the first minute the third minute they went on in the 16th minute and then the fans got on the pitch and we've just slowly increased uh pressure with these protests we've done a lot of other types of protests such as uh we took advertising boards uh anti die young and getting out of our club around london the other week and uh they went outside uh, the casino he frequents at and uh, the EFL as well. And where his, we believe his house is uh, in London as well. So, um, you know, we've we've really kicked on and done a lot of great work, had a lot of amazing coverage. The sad thing is it's coverage we don't really want because like even, even this, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but we don't want 
this coverage. We want a club yeah. and a club to be run well and to be under the radar. We we just happy just to plod along it like we used to and get called Timpot every week. We love that. That's that's what we want. We want to be the Timpot ready we used to be. But now we've become not hostile, but there's like sort of anarchy at the minute because we're so desperate and on our knees that we're forced to get in a game abandoned, which is mental and it's it's not something to celebrate. But the reaction we've had from it shows it's the right decision, and that's mad. And I, I, I was uneasy on it, if I'm honest, Craig. I, I didn't know if it'd go down well. Mm. I wasn't anti, anti what happened at the weekend, but um, I was worried how it'd be perceived. And uh, I mean, the reaction's been unbelievable. Um, everyone's been so supportive and, and behind us, and the names we've had coming out for us as well: Gary Neville, Jeff Stelling huge names in football. Ian Wright was supportive against Eastleigh in the FA Cup when we protested and uh, Alan Shearer, Gary Lineker and the likes. There's everyone on TalkSport. I mean, the only negativity I think we've had apart from a few people, like mainly Simon Jordan was a little bit negative earlier, but there's, uh, we haven't barely had anything negative. It's it's uh, more than we could ever have hoped for, really. And uh, I think it's on reflection when you look at the reaction, it shows how that decision was correct and and how far we've come as a group and uh the sad thing is i think is that i don't think dion cares doesn't care like everything we do he doesn't care like we we can get every game abandoned he doesn't care that's the problem i think you know the football world and you know i've, I've been saying this for a little while because i was aware that there was going to be protests um, you know, I'd seen it circulating around that there was going to be this pitch invasion um, and it was well organised, but it was it was a non-violent protest. But the one thing I would say is that Dai Yong has had, you know, a season and a half last season and this season to actually correct this situation. So what happened on Saturday wouldn't have happened if... He had done something a couple of months ago, but he isn't listening. However, one thing I would say, and one thing I want to bring up, is the EFL. Because as much as they are at fault for really putting him in charge, you know, they should have rejected him like the Premier League did from Reading, as he was at Hull. Um they have now turned their attention fully to him and it seems not the club. And this is a little bit different from the scenario that, you know, Bournemouth were in all those years ago. Bournemouth were potless, effectively. There was no money. Dai Yong, it's believed that he's got money. But the EFL, by banning Dai Yong, are effectively pushing him out of the club, which is probably going to lead to Reading being an administration which might be the best way out of this. Yeah, I think it. I think administration right now, if you, you asked me this three weeks ago, I, I would have still hoped for a sale. And <clears throat> six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, we were on the brink of a sale with Ginevra and um, they had a bid accepted and then we got information from Ginevra saying one thing, basically saying that uh, the club have sent through the contract with changes to what was agreed. And then the club said, and Mr. Pang, actually, I'll, I'll be specific. Mr. Pang said, no, that's not true. They just haven't responded to the contract that they agreed. So we're getting, I think now, if you look at the changes in the last couple of weeks, it looks like it was Mr. Pang that's been telling the, the porkies on that one and and uh, not not being honest with us. So um, now we're at step one again, backwards. We don't know. We know there's apparently people looking around, but do they do they have the money? Do they have, uh, do they want to bid? Do they want the whole infrastructure? Are they looking for one thing? Are they looking to asset strip us in the land or are they actually looking to run a football club properly and, and help us? Um, and it starts from step step one again. And so that could take months. And then we've heard Mr. Dyer's difficult in, in a sale and, and making things hard unnecessarily. And uh, again, that can slow down the process and he's not putting the money in at the minute. And that, I believe, is is down to 
uh, cash flow issues in China. I don't know if it's just dried up or if it's stuck, frozen or, or whatever's going on there. We know it's cash flow issues. The club have been openly honest about that, but it's what specific issues are. And I know the government, the Chinese government have to approve funds being transferred to, to a foreign to a foreign country, so to us. Yeah. And it's coming out of Hong Kong. That's part of the delays there. But I don't know if the money is even going to be coming over generally. So it's tough. But I think administration, and, and this is what you just said, um, now, for I wouldn't have said this two weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, definitely I wouldn't. But I think administration might be our best way out. And I think it might be our only way out now because you can't, as I said, we're more protected. You can't just liquidate a team. You have to put them into administration and then there's a process. But there'll be someone who picks us up on the cheap in administration anyway. I'm, I'm sure Mike Ashley will be yeah. keen for that. You know, he's, he was interested anyway. And uh, but his bid was very bad, apparently. And uh, I think that if we went into administration, that's just right up his street, isn't it? So, um, so I, I think that's what we need. But will Mr. Dye put us in administration? This is my concern. Will he put us in administration? Because I don't think he will. And I think we'll get to a point where we're more likely to not be put in administration and go bust and be a Phoenix club, but we'll have to go right to the bottom. Like bet this is exactly what happened to Berry. They didn't go bust. They were just kicked out of the league and they had to start again. It took them about 18 months to actually get started again. Although they were just a sitting duck there. They made a Phoenix club, they made two clubs and they got into a bit of a spat about that. It was all created, merged again now. It's all sorted, but that could be us. And I think that is my fear now. I would take administration um, and relegation, so be it, because I don't want to, but I would in the circumstances, because that would protect us from being kicked out of the league and just sitting there empty. And even if we did get kicked out of the league, I can't remember the Berry owner's name. Was it like Owen Dale or someone? And yes, he just yeah. wouldn't, was it Owen Dale? Yeah, he just wouldn't sell the club. And it took him ages to wrestle the club back and get Gig Lane back. And Gig Lane actually returned this summer, actually. And uh, this will be us. I and mean, then we won't have a stadium because he'll have the stadium. He'll have the training ground. We'll be playing on the on the park pitches like back in the old days. And uh, yeah, in a combined counties league or something like that. And yeah, but as Reading, but that's where I think we could be heading because I just don't think I, you can't liquidate us without administration. Administration would force a sale. And I don't think he'll put us in administration unless he's forced into it. But how can you be forced into it? I don't know if anyone can owes enough. He owes enough money for them to do that. So this is the uh, this is the issue for me. One thing I also wanted to discuss with you was Mark Bowen, who, to be honest, Mark Bowen has, and I guess he's he was a little bit of a Marmite character when he was manager of the club, but. Um, you know, he is working tirelessly to try and sort things out. However, Dai Yong Pang has gone straight over the head of Mark Bowen. Is his job pretty much redundant and he's just got the title but nothing else, no other powers? Firstly, Mark Bowen's a legend uh, for what he's done in the last... 18 months he, he came back from Wimbledon and after being if you'll remember before and I don't know if, if Bournemouth fans and other listeners will know but he initially came in as like a head of football operations yeah. and then there's a running joke that he sort of sacked the manager and hired himself mm-hmm. and took control when he uh, uh got rid of I can't remember who the manager was now off the top of my head I've lost... Uh, it track- Gomez. It was Jose Gomez. Yeah. It was Jose Gomez. Yeah, well remembered. And he went and he hired himself. I'm not sure if he did hire himself. I think he was just asked to do it and did it kind of thing. Yeah. And he did okay. I mean, he wasn't like a brilliant manager, but he was fine. He, was, he wasn't a bad manager. Let's put it that way. He was fine and he improved us. I mean, he was harshly ousted and offered another role. But I think he wanted the management job. And he'd been given it permanent, by the way, at this point. And because he started well. And then Pan- Belko Panovic came in and uh, he just, yeah, didn't, you know, left under under a cloud and unbelievably came back uh, two seasons later as like a head of football operations again. And he did wonders with, under a transfer embargo and built a team that was not very good, but competitive enough for Paul Lintz at the time. And this season, even more brilliant, a brilliant job to bring in such good talent on cheap deals. 
again under transfer embargo and he's promised these players this project and sold them this project we put in really top league one players like lewis wing and sam smith's returned and uh harvey nibs um charlie savage and ben elliott have come in with massive potential and they've trusted mark and uh mark's been been shafted he's been sidelined uh yeah. recently and eddie nidzeki who's uh mark bone's man head of play, player development has been made redundant as has our assistant manager which is just a joke really isn't it making your assistant manager redundant um andrew sparks he was our one one guy i think it were two guys ruben sellers could bring in he was one of them and yeah mark's mark's been shafted and diane pang has now gone over his head and agreed a cheap sale every player is apparently for sale now and cheap so tom holmes is about to go to luton and be loaned back to us i've heard it's about 500k um you never know fees because they're always undisclosed but it's quite cheap and uh nelson abbey who's this young superstar england under 20 defender it's going to be he's going to definitely make a profit apparently it's around 500k as well it's definitely going to be a profit on this one and he's due to go to a Premier League. I've heard Luton and I've heard Nottingham Forest and then Olympiacos on loan. So he's going to one of them. So we'll see. Um, yeah, so Nelson Abbey's off as well. So two really good players going for a pittance under under the nose of Mark Bowen and uh, Ruben Sellers. And I have to say, I mean, I think Sellers is staying in the job because he's still proving himself as a manager. But Mark Bowen... The only thing I can think of is that he feels sorry for the players he's brought in under the pretense that we're building this project and he doesn't want to leave them after that. And that's the only reason he's not walked. But I'm also surprised the club haven't just sacked him yet because I just feel like they don't want him there. But we we told Mr Pang at the end of December when we met him, we told him Mark Bowen won't getting rid of Mark Bowen will not be a popular decision. He's really well liked and he's going to go down as a legend for the work he's been doing in the worst circumstances. Um, but yeah, this CEO now, and I'm sure Mr. Dye has instructed him too, is just going under his nose and just shafting Mark Bowen to the sidelines. So it's tough. Um, Mark deserves better. And I hope when we get through this, with it, hopefully with a new owner and with a football club, I hope they keep Mark Bowen and I hope they give him an opportunity and let him build that project because his project was good. It was exciting. What he's trying to build and the people he's trying, he's brought in Brian Carey as head of recruitment and he's basically this blank piece of paper, build your team. Yeah. And he can't, neither of them can do that. We've brought in a head of recruitment who can't really recruit. And we brought in a scout who's left for Stoke six months into the job, Jared Dublin, top guy. But I don't blame him for leaving after five months because he was at, used to be Wilder's scout at Sheffield United and he came in as like head of scouting and he, he went five months later because what's the point of scouting players when you can't bring him in anyway? You've got to bring him the... You can't sort of fish in the sea at the moment at Reading. You have to fish in the, in the pond, if you like, the puddles even at the moment. And Bowen and Brian Kerridan wonders in those circumstances and what uh the club are now putting him through and, and shafting him like that and and the players he's brought in is is disgusting really i've suggested a couple of ideas of what the efl need to do next to actually get this to change um one of the most popular ones is something that efl have considered um, and it's probably a step, of course, there has been the statement that's gone out today that they are urging Dai Yong to sell the club. Um, I believe he's got another fine as well, which, to be honest, is not going to hurt his bank balance unless, you know, the reports that we've seen, you know, are true that, you know, he's not particularly well liked in China because he owes a lot of money here, there and everywhere. But... What do the EFL need to do? Because one of the options that has been muted is banning him from all sporting activity for 12 months. You know, hopefully, fingers crossed, that would get him to sell. The club might go into administration at that time. Because it could be a forced administration, does the same rules apply? But is there anything else? Incomings, outgoings, blocked? Because who knows where that money's going to go? Is that another option? What do the EFL need to do next? The EFL needs to help us 
get to a point where we can force the club into administration or force a sale and ban him. I don't know how straightforward that is or if at all if it's possible. They recommended it to an independent panel who refused and they actually said in a statement again today that they still recommend that. So we'll see how that progresses. And as you said, the fine won't hurt his pocket. He won't even pay the fine. He's, he doesn't care. He doesn't like the EFL. He, we know he doesn't like the EFL. He hates them. He thinks he's been unfairly treated. And maybe at an early stage, maybe he was to an extent. Maybe they should have been more lenient on him in the early stages, but that's not an excuse to then treat the club like he is. Um, in terms of player sales and incomings, I don't know. I don't know. There's... I think there's players they probably want to get out, if I'm honest, as well. Is it fair on them to hold them at the club against their will? There's players who just, it's not good for their careers and, and their mental health and their families. So I'm not sure that's the right thing to do by the players. But I mean, it's worrying because I think this money's coming in, these cheap deals for Abbey and Holmes, I think they're to run the club for the next couple of months. But then when that money goes, where's the next money going to come from? Probably another couple of players to go, obviously. But we're not going to have a football club at this rate. He's he's selling assets to run the club rather than sell the club. I don't know what the the EFL just need to a take accountability for putting us in this situation in the first place, and other clubs, many other clubs, including Bournemouth back in the day, you know, yeah. um, and they need to make changes that prevent this happening in the future. Uh, first and foremost, and protect protect football, protect football clubs and to stop an ownership issue in the long term. But for Reading right now, they need to make changes whereby they have more power when it gets to serious situations like this, not just so they can do it willy-nilly, but just serious points where they can step in, ban the owner, and force a club. If it's forcing the club into administration, so be it, because that is the best circumstance, I think. It feels like it is, unless he... He agrees a cheaper deal ASAP, I think, and I don't think he will. This is where we're at. So, yeah, the EFL needs to step in because we're in serious trouble. Well, let's hope that Dayong gets out of football completely, completely, you know, as soon as possible. And I think the EFL need to ban him. The ne- EFL need to ban him. Um, you know, I completely understand where you're coming from, that, you know, blocking the incomings and outgoings is probably not the right thing for the players um but you know protecting the club's funds um from this man and from Dayong Pang as well is probably you know key to Reading moving forwards in the future and hopefully fingers crossed there is somebody like Mike Ashley waiting in the background who you know is probably you know, it, it's likely that he would be waiting for, you know, a club like Reading to go into administration, a club that has got Premier League facilities, but isn't there and has been just ruined by the previous owner. Um, you know, it's a club that he could get back quite quickly, couldn't he? Yeah, I mean, I think it's perfect for for a guy like Mike Ashley. Um, I do worry about what he wants with the stadium. You know, what he's done with uh, his Coventry Stadium, isn't it? Yes, moment. yeah. And, uh, I do worry about that. And I know Newcastle fans give him a stick, but they're a different club to us, different size, different expectations. I mean, it would be a lot cheaper to run. Uh, he'd pay pay staff, pay wages, run the club well. So, and on a football football sort of perspective, so. Yeah, it, I think it, if it goes into administration, it really is made for him to come in, really, isn't it, I think? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, Nick, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Hopefully, fingers crossed, the football club will be sold as soon as possible. And, you know, this horrible saga finishes. But um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much again, mate. No, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Please remember to hit the like, subscribe, the bell button below to be alerted to any new videos we do here. Um, Do check out my initial thoughts from the other day. Um, It's a 40-minute video. I go into all the details with regards to the situation at Reading um, and also provide a few ideas, a few suggestions of how this might end. Um, Hopefully, fingers crossed, it needs to end sooner rather than later. Um, Do also check out all of our other videos as well. 
and like I say, thank you for coming to join us. And hopefully, fingers crossed, this situation will be solved sooner rather than later. Thank you.